you know, I could be flip and say it's a habit, but that isn't it. You know, first of all, I didn't want to go to Sacramento. There's no question, and I, I knew that. And people have been asking me to do it for a long time. And so I really looked and thought where I really like to be is here. And I'm not sure that I agreed with everything the council had done. Maybe not over the past 10 or 12 years, but I think there were some things I would have done differently. And I think there were some leadership roles that I would have tried at least to serve in. So it was, it was that. And, and I, I, I also see Palo Alto going in a direction that I think is maybe not the right direction. Okay, well, expand. I won't be quite as forceful as maybe Gary were if he were here, but, but, but watching what has happened, and in some ways I, I, I might lay it at our feet as well. You remember the, the general plan that we did in the 90s, the one that was led by um, a, a team of 50, a huge group. Yeah, essentially, we signed, I think, 36 to it at the beginning. By the time we were done with that, six years later, we'd gone through everybody that had ever indicated they might serve on such a committee. The result of that was what we thought was a walkable, livable community. And we were really clear on what we wanted. We spent a lot of time with two very famous designers whose names I've now forgotten, one out of Berkeley, one out of Florida, both of whom I thought were terrific. And, but when I left, we still hadn't put zoning in place. And if I go back and can track that, I think perhaps that's what happened at the Hyatt site. It may even be what happened at the Alma site. I'm not really sure, and I, I'm not going to go back and pick it apart again. But I think if there are two spots in Palo Alto that indicate something wasn't going in the right direction, those are the two. Way too intense for most people at the corner of Charleston and El Camino. Close, too close to the street. A design that I think is not user friendly enough. I've spent a lot of time just walking around and they're looking at it. And then, um, and I know John McNellis has been waiting a long, long time to do the property on Alma. It, it was, that was in the works when I left 12 years ago. It's hard to, when I mention it to the current council, they say, but we had nothing to do with that. That happened before we got there. So perhaps this all transpired between 2000 and maybe 2006 or seven when the current group came. I don't know, but it's one of the areas that I'm, I'm troubled about. And so that would lead us right into John Ariaga's building, which is now proposed for the corner, which will be called so-called 27 University. And I know there's a lot of excitement about it, but it, to me, at least, it looks like it will loom large over the city. And maybe I'm provincial, but I'm not sure we're there yet. So that's, that's led me way to a, a, down a different path, which is I think the character of the city is changing. And I would say to that end, I would look at the area that Bill and I both live in, where we're starting to see too many houses come down, huge houses go up in their place, and a different balance in what that community was. So um, it may be my provincial Ness, I've lived here a long, I don't, you know, it may be, I've lived here a long time, I come from a small town, I'm used to, you know, a, a more comfortable surrounding, but suddenly I'm feeling like we're, we're overwhelmed with larger buildings and um, certainly much bigger houses than we had seen, and uh, just a different character to the community. Now, so can I single-handedly change it? I can try. So you point, the, the ones you mentioned here are Alma Plaza and the Hyatt, mm -hmm. and of course, mm -hmm. yet to be considered a right. um, yeah. project. Um, and, and you say you don't really know what happened with those. Is that because you were too focused on county government? I mean, you're no. a resident of Palo Alto. Oh, no, no. You're a council member. Why wouldn't you know? Why wouldn't I know exactly what right. happened with it? Right. You're right. I wasn't tracking it totally. I was, by that time, I was at the county. In fact, when the buildings went up on Charleston, I was probably as surprised as anyone. No, I, I hadn't been watching the council meetings. I hadn't been watching what was happening there. So, mea culpa as far as that goes. 
but um, my understanding also is it didn't go through the council at all, that this is what was currently on the books that you could do under the general plan. That was the zoning that was allowed, and, and it went through according to people who were there then, and I think Judy was among them. It was, it was simply something that was allowed. Well, the, both of those projects went through PC, so the underlying zoning really is irrelevant. But they both were PCs um, and pretty controversial PCs. I didn't remember that the Hyatt was that controversial. Well, yes, it was. Way back it was. When they talked about it being two parts, when it was being both the boutique and it was going to be the homes, yes. But I hadn't known that by the time it got to being houses, it was PC. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, both of those projects, because there were so many things about them. That, John's I knew as PC, but, but no, they were both, that... They were both PCs. And I mean, what... We can check on that, but... Uh, I don't... Well, let's go on from there, because I don't know what they, what the Hyatt, or what whomever developed that, gave up what, what their, unless it was affordable housing before the Palmer Rule went through, I don't know. Okay. So clearly, though, I was off doing another job and um, not tracking everything that was happening here. Um, before we leave the, what, your, your tenure, um, your past tenure, um, you left, one of the last things you did when you left, of course, was serve your final year as mayor. And during that term, um, you hired Frank Bennis as city manager. There are a lot of people that attribute the things that you're describing as uh, challenges that the council had and that the community had in the mm -hmm. 2000s um, to uh, the hiring of Frank Bennis mm -hmm. and the poor decision that a lot of people think that was. I wonder if you can reflect a bit on that and um, comment on mm -hmm. that search and your role mm -hmm. in bringing Frank Bennis to Palo Alto. Very clearly. Frank was not my choice. The morning that we were interviewing Frank, I remember really well, Stanford had asked me as the mayor to go over and present to the whole board. They had a board meeting. And I left the meeting here at about 8.30 and said to Gary, you know, please don't allow a vote while I'm gone. I don't want Frank. I have somebody else that I want to vote for. And when I came back, they had voted Frank into place. And um, that was, oh, January morning, I guess, January, February. And uh, I was extraordinarily disappointed. And I, I know how it happened. It doesn't matter about going into it at this point. But Frank was never my choice. I was very unhappy with Frank. Okay. So I'm glad to put it on the record. Mm -hmm. and, and Frank, I, I don't think Frank would disagree that I was unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's kind of unique to your candidacy that I'd like to kind of get out of the way is the whole issue of moving council elections to the <laughs> number of years. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes a lot of people as awfully Was I Machiavellian? That um, you urged that to, uh, the result of that was a nice smooth transition for your own political plans. Mm -hmm. um, but without really getting into that, um, I'm wondering if what your initial reactions are to this change. Um, we have a mm -hmm. not terribly competitive city council race, um, not terribly competitive school board race. Is that related to the change in election cycle or not? I think absolutely not. I first brought this up two years ago. Had no intention of running for city council. It was when I was being wooed consistently to run for Sacramento, which I was until last January. Um, I, I'm not that clever. I wish, you know, I wish I were. I wish I could say, gosh, two years ago, I sat down and said, if I can convince the city, this city, to go to even elections, which 13 cities now have of the 15 in the county, which makes it extraordinarily much easier for the, for the registrar to deal with, um, and saves money. It'll save a good 100000 a year, probably more than that. Uh, our, my goal at that point was to come to the city council and say, here's a way that you can save money. Here's a way you can be consistent with the, all the other cities in the county, even though I know you think it's fun and it's a, you know, a great small town thing to have elections on odd years. It really doesn't serve you well. 
Right, and that's and, exactly what you said at the time. And, I, and I'm wondering I still that believe now it. that we're in the midst of a campaign that mm -hmm. has turned mm -hmm. out with the character that it has, any, any second I, thoughts I, about it? No, because, because many people have said, oh, Liz, this is your fault. You're the one who wanted uh, to sure. switch it. Yeah. Many, yeah. And I've said, well, look at Menlo Park, even, even your election. Los Altos has a very spirited election going on. That would say that 13 cities don't have spirited elections that go on. And, you know, as I said, I think it was fun. Gary and I have gone around and around about this, and he has said, you knew what you were doing. I didn't, of course not. If, if I could have said in May of 2010, here's where I'm going to be in October of 2012, I would have had such a great crystal ball that I would have bought gold when it was at 600 or something. So would you interpret the lack of, um, of candidates in this race to a general satisfaction with the performance of the city council? No, in fact, um, Mike Cobb would smile to hear me say this. But Mike said, when we put term limits in place, and we still have nine on the council, it will not be long before we start to not have enough candidates. And so even though we had a lot in the last race, I don't think it was difficult to choose the people who, who finally won, even though that, that seemed like, you know, I think they had maybe 13. I've forgotten how many ran in the last one. And, and five were elected. And um, I, I think it's hard to find women to run. It's hard to find younger women to run when Nancy ran two years ago, or whenever it was now, two years ago, three years ago, it was so hard to get her to run, it was hard to get a woman to run. And then Karen ran again, but um, all over the county we're seeing decreases in women and we're seeing decreases in people who are under 50 running. So more men than, than women because mm -hmm. men seem to feel more comfortable with that. But it's, it's and it, we haven't seen I don't think we've seen a woman in her 30s run in Palo Alto in a long time. Just in your responses, you've demonstrated your, um, your personal relationship with prior politicians. Right. By referring to them by right. their first name, Mike, Gary, etc. Should have used their last names. One of the yeah. um, criticisms of your candidacy, frankly, is that not only has she already served and had her shot at it, but She's really an insider. She's part of the old network of political leaders in the community. Um, why um, is she essentially standing in the way of new, new blood coming onto the council with new, fresh ideas, um, different perspectives? Any response to that? I, I hardly think that I am. Um, with Mark Berman running at age 31, I don't think he thought twice about running when I was running. And um, I'm sorry, there aren't more, but I don't think there was anything about me running that would keep somebody else from running. I, I really, I, and, and maybe it's naive, but I really cannot believe that's, that's the case. You know, when Larry ran, I, he had a good field that ran against him. Um, he certainly is insider as anyone. Larry Klein, I'll start using last names. <laughs> um, when Joe ran again for supervisor, Joe. Uh, Joe, Joe Simidian, that's Simidian, nice. that's his last name. Uh, you know, but I, I think part of, I think one of my assets is that I do have good connections. But there's and a I, certain clubbiness to it, right? Well, you know, there's a certain clubbiness to getting stuff accomplished, too. You know, and I think one of the things I'll bring to this is I know the region well. I know who to get in touch with. I, you know, no VTA, I know Caltrain, I know MTC. I know the people who are involved in that. I think that's an asset. And, uh, you know, I'd, if there was somebody young and dying to run, I wish they had run. OK, let's shift gears to um, the city's financial um, situation, and in particular, the um, unfunded liabilities that we face with pension and health care benefits and so forth. The, the current council has taken a number of steps to try to fix what prior mm -hmm. councils mm -hmm. have, have done. Um, I went back and looked and to see if you were on the council when some of the more major changes were made and, and you weren't. Um, but uh, <laughs> Only d bullet I've dodged so far, Janady. <laughs> but I, I would like you to, um, to share with us what your perspective is on what further steps this city should be looking to take 
to address um, the expanding. Right, employee. right. And you, you did it. Well, you did a particularly good job last summer on the, um, I think it was a July article you wrote on it that I've quoted many times. But I, I think using AB 340, it certainly makes a big difference because the things that I would have, when I was answering your questionnaire, I had all the answers in there and all of a sudden AB 340 passed. So raising the age limit makes a big difference. Putting a cap on makes a difference. Also not allowing spiking makes a difference. But one of the big differences, and I don't know whether the city has as much of a problem with this as we do at the county, but the payouts are incredible. So when we pay out somebody who's leaving, at the end of their, their tenure, we pay for their sick leave up to a certain length of time, and we also pay for any of their vacation. And some of that runs two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. So it's a lot. And it's one of the things that I would hope the city would look at. But, but looking now, being able to put that AB 340 right into place makes a huge difference. And that will give the city that opportunity to do it right away. And, and so beyond that, what levels what, what, are there to, I mean, we've gone to a two-tier system. Right, here. right, and which, um, which is good, and which we went to at the county as well. And there are some candidates that are, that are talking about moving in a direction of a um, defined uh, contribution right. plan. Right, and, and that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the traditional pension program. Is, are those steps that you would support taking? And we've, we've supported that at the county as well. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things we're talking about right now. We were just, just talking with SEIU this morning. But one other thing is because we've reached the top in what currently the employee can contribute, what you can go to next is you can get into what the employer contributes. And that's the discussion we're having at the county. And I don't know whether we'll be successful or not, but that's the next discussion that we could have in order to, to meet the PERS requirements. I don't think it's going to be popular, but I, I think it's a good way to go. You, but it's uh, tough. I mean, this is the unfunded liability is, is amazing. And as you pointed out, Palo Alto's unfunded liability is among the highest in the county. When you declared, um, you identified infrastructure as one of your Mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could um, uh, describe for us how you would prioritize attacking the infrastructure problem, what, um, whether you agree with mm -hmm. the infrastructure task force, um, what are your thoughts on where our, our infrastructure dollars yeah. should spend? First of all, I admire that they put a group together. And I, I think that the group met, there were 17 of them, they had 20 meetings at least. I went to a couple of their closing meetings. They were in great depth, and, uh, and, and I think what they've come up with is, you know, is, is very good. They've identified certainly structures as much as anything. But what I'm hearing from the community, and you know I walk a lot, and uh, Betsy and I were out this morning, we identified five Betsy. streets. Betsy Bechtel. <laughs> Goodness, I, it's not name dropping, I swear to me, that's just what I call them. <laughs> um, and, and we looked at streets, we looked at Palo Alto Avenue, we looked at her own street. We looked at, and some of these streets are in absolutely terrible shape. And I know they've added an extra two million. I don't think it's sufficient to bring the streets up, even though, um, in this case, Pat Burt, I'll use his last name, and I totally disagree on it. He thinks that they're, they're really headed in a good direction and that um, the fair rating will be up to good within two or three years. I, I don't think it's sufficient. I think, uh, again, I don't think I've got a lot who agree with me on this, but I think that what people pay attention to are the streets and the sidewalks. That's really what they're interested in. And the other thing that I would add to this is the developers need to be in, in some way held responsible for what happens to the street and what happens to the sidewalk after they've been there. And I, I'm looking in my own neighborhood. I can see what's happened. The, the streets are a disaster after they did the one in the corner near us, which is Cowper and, and Seal. Three, three years of it absolutely destroyed that street and the sidewalk that went with it. And I'm not sure why the developers haven't been held accountable in some way for taking care of that. Uh, it's the same that I've, uh, which I saw up on, on Palo Alto Avenue this morning. Bikers really hesitate on those streets. 
And as Betsy Bechtel points out to me, it's really dangerous for bikes. So, which, which, so let me just continue on that one for a minute because one of the areas that I think is the most important is when I was on the school board, we were down to 7,000 kids and the number of kids biking went down, down, down. In the 90s, it began to come back up, but it's recent that at least Penny Ellison tells me they have document, documentation that the number of kids riding their bikes is up a huge amount. And I think that's fabulous. They're not very skilled bikers. And I've learned, you know, I, I wouldn't go on North California in the morning for anything between 7.30 and 8.30. I don't even want to walk in the morning. But they really are, um, they, they are riding at least. You know, and you know, forgive them that they don't all know the safest ways to ride, but at least they're riding. And I'm so glad to see that, but I think it's up to us to make the streets safer than they are. And again, on to bike lanes, and one of the best people I've seen talk about this was a man from Bogota who spoke here at Carberly in May and talked about how you create safe bike lanes. And one of the things he said that I thought is absolutely true, if you can't create some kind of physical delineation, just like an HOV lane, if you don't create some sort of bullock or uh, you know, bulb out, something that protects you. So if, the, if, if you're gonna bike, here's the sidewalk and here's the street, if you can put some indication here that cars will not cross over, many more people will bike, according to him. And I, I think it's true. New York has done this, you know, where they've, they've demarcated where you, can, where you can ride safely. You don't mean just a strike. You mean no, no, I mean, some, I mean something physical. Yeah. yeah. So just as, you know, in some of the HOV lanes, when, when they, in the morning, they lay down a strip and you, you go into the HOV lane. But I, I think, you know, I'm, again, I'm not sure it's going to be wildly popular, but I think far more people would bike. I might even bike. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a big biker. It, it always is a little frightening, I think, to ride in Palo Alto. I'll bet you ride, don't you? Pretty much. <laughs> oh, anyhow. Uh, you, you have, you, you referenced this, the unique perspective you have of a school board member who, at the time of the passage of the utility right. tax, right and the negotiation of the lease with right. the city. Right. Um, as you know, if you're elected, this issue's gonna come right back in your lap um, from the perspective of the city. I know. I'm wondering, um, how did that happen? Well, what I'm wondering is, how have your views of the, um, on that lease changed, and uh, are you prepared to make some changes in the structure of that lease, or not even renew the lease at all, as was recommended by the infrastructure group? It will be tempting not to renew the lease at all, because I think that there's been a huge change in, in the financial well-being of, of the two. The schools were in terrible, terrible shape. 86, 87, it was, um, you know, it was pre-basic aid. We only had ADA. It was, it was a really, really tough time. I think, though, that's going to be difficult, no matter what. This, this is a town that really is driven by the schools. And um, if they're correct and they're going up 2% in enrollment every year, it's going to be hard to resist what the schools are maintaining is going to be a need for another high school. Um, I, and I've said this out loud, and every time I do, I, I get dinged for it. But I, <clears throat> I'm just so sorry Foothill didn't get to go in there last summer. I think had they thought it through with Foothill, and uh, again, people like Betsy Bechtel and Bruce Swenson have both said, we didn't do our homework, we didn't do a good enough job working with the current city council and with the school board. If we'd sat down earlier, we might have said, here are possibilities for, for dealing with this. Um, I, I have an intern working with me this summer who's from Foothill, and um, she hates to go to classes at Carpelly, Foothill classes. She said, do you know how old and ugly that building is? And I thought, I do, but um, uh, it's, it's I, I understand the schools wanting to protect this. You know, before I was on the school board, the land had been sold off in the 80s. That was, you know, where Crescent Park was and where some of the others were. But um, 
I, I don't know. I, I don't know how brave I'm going to be, to be honest. I don't know whether I'll be able to say to the schools, you know, which the council couldn't do last year either, or last, when it, whenever they voted on it, it was hard to do. But, but I'll do my best. The, the issue changed in the sense that the school district, if they aren't leasing coverly to the city of Palo Alto, they're not going to go sell it. So it, isn't it more a question now of what are our objectives? Where in 1985 or whenever it was implemented, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the objective really was, the unwritten objective, was to financially help the school district mm -hmm, in a mm -hmm. tough situation. Mm -hmm. um, today, as you point out, that situation is very different. Um, theoretically, the school district could administer its own leases of the portions of the mm -hmm, site that it mm -hmm. doesn't want to utilize mm -hmm. to the same community groups that the city's mm -hmm. leasing it to. Mm -hmm. There's not a real obvious reason for the city to be in the middle uh, as a, as a sub-tenant landlord. Mm -hmm. So let's hope we're brave enough to make that decision. So that's the direction yeah. that you would... I, that's the direction I, I hope I will go in. Mm -hmm. Again, because I was there then. I do remember this. I mean, it was my interaction with the council at the time, whom I knew well, and said, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in a terrible situation. Um, I think Gary Fazzino is the one who came up with the utility tax idea. And uh, what I think is interesting is at the time, we talked about going back to the voters. We said, you know, this, right. we, we'll, we'll come back to the voters with this. There was an implied revisiting of the uh, It was tax. in print. Yep. Yeah, it wasn't in print on the ballot, no, though. But it was in print in press. And we all agreed, because we, there were big groups of us that sat around and said, this is what needs to happen. And uh, it... Um, it didn't. Yeah. Let's try to get one more question in before we run out of the 30 minutes here. Um, okay. On the subject of, um, yeah. of PCs, I want to go back to uh -huh. that old uh -huh. question. Um, I don't know if you followed the Gateway Project that Jim Baer had has recently had approved by the council. Much more closely than the other two. Right. Yes. Yeah. Recent. Yeah. So right. it came to the city as a PC. Right. Um, essentially, any major development pro uh, project is now coming to the city council as a PC project, which, as you know, basically throws out the existing zoning mm -hmm. and negotiation. Right. Um, are you happy with that system? And no. if you're not, what changes do you mm -mm. feel need to do? No, and, and so again, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time talking to Greg Scharf about it. And I, I don't think there's a way that we can go forward with that without it making some financial sense. I don't know how we'll do it yet, but with each one of these, the developer comes out ahead. And, and we used to negotiate, and we would say, you know, I, I think we were too loose even when I was on the council. You know, an artwork would go in, or a fountain would go in, or something that was really somewhat fluffy. Uh, when affordable housing was required, I always felt that that was a really good requirement. But as I understand, you can't do that with the, you know, with the new state ruling on on affordable housing, which is unfortunate. But um, developers will always attempt to use the PC. The only one I ever knew who never used a PC was Chuck Keenan. Mm -hmm. he, really, he never did. Jim Baer was famous for using PCs and charming about doing it. And, um, you know, and I, I know when they got to the Gateway Project that that was, you know, in there equally. And, and to be honest about that one, I was sorry they didn't go up five stories. I thought that was probably the first chance they might have had to see how that actually would work in the community. I don't know why they didn't. I've heard two or three different reasons why they finally made that decision. First chance to make what work? Putting housing on top of commercial space? No, no, no. Going up, they were going to go up further than 50 feet, as right. I understand. Right. And the well, only how, would just, how would we have measured whether that turned out to be a good thing? I, mean, I, I think by public opinion. I mean, how else? <laughs> it's a good chance to, you know, the JCC has received lots of, um, of negative comments because it did, it did go up that high. And I actually thought, you know. But, but based on that observation, then one would think you would take the view, well, we better not let another building go up above the height limit. I mean, if we're going to well, base it on just that was, public reaction, that. That was barely about, above the height limit. That didn't go very far. I mean, John's buildings, as I read it, 
one of them goes up 160 feet. Right. That's, that's way above what I understand the gateway was going to go. Oh, yeah. I think the gateway was maybe going to hit 60 feet right. max. I actually thought that might have been a good use of that particular corner. It's transit. It's right near, right across the street from the railroad. John's project, I think, is a, another different animal. But so, so in the case of the Ariaga project, the 27 University, um, d does it matter to you that we have a philanthropic element to this that really doesn't directly involve the city, but instead is a major gift to the university that is a part of this? Does it that, does it bothers that... me incredibly, so yes. Explain how and how it would affect your judgment. <laughs> So after 12 years of dealing with Stanford, and I know it's your alumni, you know, I, I acknowledge that, but I, I think it's been forgotten along the way that Stanford is a developer. And while I hear from this that Stanford is not involved, however, as I, under, as I understand it, as I understand it from John Ariaga, you know, who was my neighbor for a number of years, this is going to be what, whatever, uh, Whatever proceeds are realized from the rentals there, they go to Stanford. There's no question. It's Stanford property. I mean, it's in Palo Alto, but it's, it's Stanford property. So to put up a theater, um, and so I'm reading is just the shell, uh, which, is, which it's been all along. I haven't, I haven't talked to John oh, since he you know, had everyone into his office who was on the council or interested in running or whatever since last spring. So I, I haven't seen the latest iteration. But I, I, I just, it just doesn't seem fair, to be quite honest. It doesn't seem that that much impact on the city, and you put it far more elegantly than I just did. You, you talked about it as a, a benefit. Tell me what you said, because they're great words. <laughs> but essentially what it says is there's a very small benefit for a very large and impactful building, and I and I would I agree with that. 